And then when I talked about what had happened to me, so many heads nodded. And that's, that was the change point for me. And I realized if I was gonna write a book called Speak, and if I was gonna try to get this conversation going about not only how do we support survivors, but how do we do a much better job educating our children about healthy, comprehensive, uh, integrity-based um, sex education. To the Harbor Grace excursion with the voice to have. Books really saved my life. So, I want to start, Lori, by asking you something that may be a little bit awkward and difficult because, <laughs> well, the, the, the topic is awkward yeah. and difficult. Yeah. I mean, you're sharing things that are painful and things that people don't want to talk about and things that we're often taught to hide away. Right. So how do you prepare yourself and get yourself ready to be vulnerable in that way and mm. talk about that thing that people you know, keep hidden in the dark? You know, it's interesting. Um, uh, when I was a kid, if I would try to raise a difficult subject or I was always the kid asking the question, you know, when I had the, and I would get in so much trouble for it, my poor sainted mother. Um, and now I, it's my life, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if I ever get a crown, and I would like one at some point, for the record, maybe like in another 40 years, um, I want an elephant in the front of the crown because I am the queen of the elephant in the room. Um, because that's, uh, I know the cost that children and teenagers pay when we don't allow them to tell us, when we don't listen carefully to what they're going through, when we don't help give them the language to discuss their experiences and the language that they need to become supported uh, in whatever ways they need. And that's why we lose our children um, to so many different painful things. Um, and we can stop that, but it requires the adults in the room, um, and maybe that's why Shout is, it is published as a YA, but it's YA with the eyes looking directly at the adults in the room. Um, it's our responsibility to kind of create, we were talking about community earlier, to create community so that we can become comfortable with the language mm -hmm. first and foremost, and then we can do what our children require us to do in terms of offering them support uh, and leadership. Mm -hmm. Is that something you learned how to do, how to have those difficult conversations? Because, I mean, there's just so much that is awkward. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and, but there is, yeah, right? Yeah. And a lot of it has to do, like, the conversation around consent yeah. and even just sex ed and the birds and the bees. Like, parents kind of pass it off to each other. Like, okay, who's going to talk to? Right. It's that time. Right. They're that age, and they're asking those questions. And it's kind of a cultural joke about how nobody wants to talk about it. So is that something you can learn? Yeah, I'm the condom queen. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and you know, I have, to, I have to really shout out to the reader who changed my life. Um, this happened about a year after Speak was published, so it's about 2000, and I'm speaking into a giant high school auditorium in Phoenix, Arizona. And in those days, I thought my job as a visiting author was to talk about symbolism and metaphor, which no teenager worth their salt wants to hear about. Every English teacher in this room goes, uh-huh, we tried that, didn't work, they don't care. I didn't care either, I hated English class. But I didn't hate you. Um, <laughs> And uh, so this, so I was just, you know, and I would, in the early days, I would gloss over my family's experience. My father was an alcoholic, a uh, World War II veteran with PTSD that had everything to do with the culture of silence that reigned in our house. We didn't talk about the elephant in the room, even though it was crushing us. And then when I was sexually assaulted when I was 13, I didn't tell anybody because we didn't talk about things. Um, but in the in that audience in Phoenix, I didn't say those things. I said, well, you know, my dad went through some hard times, and middle school and high school were pretty dreadful for me. And bless this young man who raises his hand, and he was a giant kid. Like he's like, well, he looked, I told the kids today, he looked like Hagrid compared to the rest of his classmates. And he says, Miss, so what was up with your dad? I was like, oh, 
And that was the first time I said publicly, my father is an alcoholic, and explained a little bit about his war experience and how that affected the family. And then his hand goes up again, because he's that kid, right? I hope he runs for Senate soon. And he says, Miss, so what was up with you? And that was the first time that I publicly said, this is what I went through, this is how it affected me. And there were so many heads in the audience nodding. First, when I talked about my dad, and I was like, oh my goodness, look at all those children who have a, an adult like that in their lives. And then when I talked about what had happened to me, so many heads nodded. And that's, that was the change point for me. And I realized if I was gonna write a book called Speak, and if I was gonna try to get this conversation going about not only how do we support survivors, but how do we do a much better job educating our children about healthy, comprehensive, uh, integrity-based um, sex education and consent so that we can prevent the next generation, then it's my job to become comfortable with the awkward. Yeah. Um, it can be done. That's you have to practice saying vagina a lot. I think, can we all do it together? Is that, is that well, weird? We, we did that with my, I did that with my kids when they were in middle school. We Let's sat around the table Everybody. and we said, Vagina, 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 vagina. This is Canada, friends. Let's do it. Come on. Vagina, 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 vagina. Scrotum. This is the land of Dr. Jen Gunter, right? My my hero. You know, it's interesting because you talked about that that the conversation. Here are my guidelines for how often you need to be talking to your kids about things like their bodies and, and, and in an age-appropriate way. Um, think about how many times you have a conversation with your children about safe driving. Mm. You would not give your kid one conversation about stopping at stop signs and then hand them the car keys, right? right? You spend years going when they're in the front seat. Oh my gosh, did you see that jerk? Did you see that left-hand turn? You've gotta be so careful with the left-hand turns. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing flow of wisdom. You need to be talking to your kids about healthy sexuality and consent and th their bodies at least as much as you're talking to them about how to drive a car safely. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a great parallel and such a, a great framing reference mm. because that's something parents know is a thing that their kids are going to do. Right. But can be dangerous if done improperly or without the right knowledge. Yes. So precisely. It's it can be exactly the same. Thank you for that. Um, folks who have read who's read speak. I, you don't like. Okay, so quite a few of us. I love you. <laughs> now, folks who have read Speak um, will naturally, I mean, I did it, pick up Shout and start looking for parallels. It's the book nerd in me. I'm like, right. oh, yes, I see, the, I see the lines. I was the kid who actually liked the symbolism. Oh, I wanted the brownie see? points. Right. <laughs> um, but I think another angle to look at it and something I'm very curious about is how you wrote Speak 20 years ago, and now you're sharing your story in this form now. How did sharing Melinda's story open up the avenues for you to share your own? Let me be really clear about how this unfolded in my heart. Um, I actually started to write Speak, to, uh, the work started in 23 years ago. Um, it took me uh, like uh, decades after I was attacked before I finally told anybody. Mm. And the only reason I went, which is what the story of so many of us, my depression and my own PTSD was affecting my children so gravely that I realized I was failing as a mother. So I finally, you know, this is, I was a very different person than I am right now. Um, and I finally found the right therapist. Speak is in part dedicated to her. And um, I was, boy, did I cry uh, several rivers. Uh, I cried an ocean in that woman's room and unlocked a lot of stuff and, and started the healing, started the growth. Out of that came the writing of Speak. And at that point, I had been, I, only, I, I was a very failed picture book writer and I'd been working on Fever 1793, for those of you who know that book. If I, if I was anything, I was a journalist first and I was a historical writer. Um, I really wrote Speak for me. I never thought, ever thought it would be published. 
Um, and it was rejected for the um, uh, writers in the room that some fool turned down to speak. I laminated that rejection letter, so um, you know you just never know. And so when it was published, um, and Speak is not my story. Speak is a highly fictionalized version of my emotional truth, like the party and all that. That was not what happened to me. If you want to know what happened to me, you can read Shout because at this point in my life, I'm I've, I'm sitting in the confidence in, in my own power that I can tell that honestly without any fictionalization. And it really, it, it has just unfolded in its own way, beginning to have the opportunities to talk to students, becoming somebody who's listened to so many survivors mm -hmm. and some perpetrators talk about their, you know, what happened. Um, and then, so it's, it's, it's unfolded in a really organic and ultimately, I think, healthy way for me. Mm. But I, I couldn't have done it in any, I had to fictionalize it first. And for the writers in the room, um, if you have something from your own experience that you want to draw on, because that's very powerful, you know, you've got wisdom from that experience. You just fictionalize it. You make the real person who hurt you, make them ugly. They'll never recognize themselves because they think they look good. Um, you know, that's, fiction has been used to, um, to nurture ourselves and to make ourselves stronger mm -hmm. as long as we've been people. For sure. Um, so Shout is not fiction, but it's not a uh, regular memoir either. Um, it's a memoir in verse. Yeah. It's poetry. And you mentioned that your father wrote poetry. And, yeah. Um, so I'd love to hear more about that writing process. Like, what's it like to, to not be telling a, a beginning to end story, to be piecing it together through right poetry, like what are the limitations of that? But what is the freedom that that allows you to do? Oh man, freedom. Um, the first piece of my freedom comes from being a woman of a certain age. And I am so angry. Mm. And I, I find a lot of energy in that mm. rage. Um, because I've lived long enough that I've seen a couple of generations of people coming and going and I've seen kids being broken by systems that we can change. Mm. Um, things like, uh, you know, systematic rape culture, just like systematic racism. These are things that we have it in our power to change in one generation. And if we don't, or if we don't try to make those changes, then we become part of the problem. So a nice, slow burning, constant rage is a, is a very motivating thing. And the reason that this book was written is because um, when the Me Too movement, which always remember was started by Tarana Burke in 2006, mm -hmm. um, and make sure you're following her because she's one of the most important leaders of this movement, but it became more uh, vi visual, the Me Too movement, because of some of the white ladies in Hollywood mm -hmm. in, uh, was that 1718? And then the, uh, the backlash started, 2017. I was listening to a podcast about the backlash. I was in New York City walking down the road, and I became a walking volcano. I was just like, people were diving out of the way of the sidewalk because I clearly looked like I needed to punch somebody in the throat. And it was just, I've just heard from so many people, and I know the pain that infects every family in North America has been touched by sexual violence. Mm -hmm. Every single family. Um, and if it affects a parent, then that gets transmitted to their children, right? So imagine if a disease suddenly hit every family in North America tomorrow, the world would stop mm -hmm. and it would be, have all of our focus and all of our attention. And so I'm listening to the, the BS that was starting to fly um, in the political sphere and that's when lines of poetry, it, feel, it felt like, like lava, right? The lines of poetry started to drop into my head and I kept on stopping to write them on my phone. And uh, I've been writing poetry my whole life because of my dad. And so I, by the end of that, that walk, I called my editor and I said, so, this is what the editor, no editor wants to ever get this phone call. <laughs> so you know that novel that's two years late. So I'm gonna put that to the side. What I really wanna do is to write a memoir in free verse, right? <laughs> and my editor took a long drink of whiskey on the other end of the phone. She didn't, 
but she, she's a very excellent editor. She should have been a therapist. And she says, well, that sounds like something you need to explore. <laughs> but I wrote it, the, the reason that I made that choice to avoid a through narrative mm -hmm. um, is because I'm t I want these poems to either punch you in the gut or to feel like a hug. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I want them to do both things. Mm -hmm. And that means that I want you to read a poem and stop and take a breath. And if I had a character with scenes crafted to keep you turning the pages, you wouldn't stop to take those breaths. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I made that artistic choice. Uh, and it was very, um, in terms of the craft, you know, I've, been, I've written a lot of novels um, and I've done some graphic novels now, that's fun. But sometimes, you know, going, pushing yourself beyond that limit you think that you need to stay within is very healthy as an artist. I can imagine. What was the most difficult part of it? Like, I mean, I can imagine there's, the revision process is very different, but uh, were there poems that just didn't work for the whole book that you really loved? Or were there, were there pieces where you're like, th there's something missing the same way you would say, oh, there's a, a lag right, in the middle right, here? Right, right, yeah. It, that's a good question. So I wrote, I don't know, four or 500 poems. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were just, you know, not very good. <laughs> but you have to write the not good stuff to clear it out and then something better comes up, wells up from within you. And, um, and I just kept on sending to my editor, who just kept on saying, keep exploring. <laughs> <laughs> and she's really, really, really a wonderful editor. Her name is Kendra Levin. And um, she was the perfect partner um, on, on this project. And so, um, and then I thought I would pretty much said everything I needed to say. And this is where, where we need editors, right? As well as therapists. And, and she, I had not written many poems about what high school had been like for me. Because mm. frankly, I try not to think about it because it was horrible um, for a lot of reasons. And uh, I was attacked just a few weeks before ninth grade started. We had just moved to another, I was in different schools in sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and twelfth grades. And then my dad was a mess. Um, so there was nothing good about my life. And, I really didn't want to even think about high school. What happened to me at the end of high school is my senior year, I became a foreign exchange student. So I spent my senior year living on a pig farm in Denmark, which was the best thing ever in my whole life. And you'll know how much I hated high school when I tell you that the pig farm in Denmark was a big step up. <laughs> um, but so my editor Kendra said, you know, maybe, maybe your readers would Want, would, would get something out of seeing your struggles after the attack. Mm -hmm. And that's such a simple thing, right? But honestly, just to, we don't, the thing about blind spots is that you don't know you have blind spots. Mm -hmm. I went, oh. And I really didn't want to revisit that place. Yeah. But what happened is I did revisit that place. And I think some of the best poems in the book, some of the best things I've ever written in my life are written about those years. And now I can listen to music from that time period. Wow. I've always like had a couple songs from when I was in high school that I loved, but I, any more than two songs in a row from those years, and I would be like, nope, turning it off. Mm -hmm. And now I can go there. So yeah, I really, so it was, interesting. right? Yeah, like, and I, I know that feeling. There's, yeah. 2007 was an interesting year in my life. And I vividly can recall all like the top 10 right. pop songs of right. that time. And it br instantly brings me back yeah. to those years. And yeah. so I, I, I can imagine how listening to music from that time would evoke an emotion. Um, an emotion that I, that I have that's very tied to uh, sexual violence, racial violence is, is constant fear, mm. but also vigilance, mm. right? You, um, uh, there's a, a, an image you evoke in your book about rabbits, and I just picture a tiny little bunny rabbit just, just being really skittish and always looking about with its little nose and scared. And I just feel like how, how can we really be safe in rape culture? Can we ever not be skittish rabbits? You know, this, and this ties in also to the reason that, at least in the United States, we're still dealing with censorship challenges. Um, and it, it's such a, 
position of privilege to say that children deserve to be innocent, right? Which means that we're not gonna tell them the truth about the world, which means our family occupies a position of, of economic and often racial privilege and, and sort of we're the default, so we don't have to be honest with our kids about how monstrous the world can be. Um, and uh, censorship has nothing to do with protecting children, by the way. Censorship has to do with protecting adults who don't know how to have these conversations with their mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's an interesting balance point for us to find, though, because we don't want our children to be existing in fear. Mm -hmm. um, kids who have been through trauma will, will always have that, that hypervigilance. Um, I don't wear skirts. I, I really feel uncomfortable. I'll probably never wear, you know, it's rare for me. I'm, I can wear a skirt if it's really long, but there's just something so visceral for me uh, about that vulnerability that you almost always see me in pain. So that's like one way that I've accommodated my own fear. Mm -hmm. And I think the way that we as a culture though, combat this um, is to start having, is to take some control. Right, you can't, because the sad truth is, is that bad things happen to good people all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and when I'm talking to teenagers, I always say that's like the, hor the horror of adult life and a teen life is that you learn that, that you can't control the things that happen to you. The flip side of that is that you have almost total control over how you react to that. Mm -hmm. But those of us who are the aunties and uncles in the room, the, the, you know, the adults, the village, trying to love all these kids, we need to make sure that they have safe spaces and they have resources to help them handle whatever comes their way. And if you're as, as frustrated and infuriated about this culture, in that, that first of all, we don't talk to our boys about healthy sexuality. Mm -hmm. So many of our boys are learning about um, sexual behavior through pornography on phones. Usually around age 11 is when they start watching that. And parents usually don't have that one conversation until their sons are 16. Mm. So we are failing all of our children. Um, we are failing them when we allow rape mythology to just be bounced around the internet unchecked when we don't take the time ourselves to learn, well, was I told the truth? What is mythology and what are the statistics and how can we do a better job honoring each other? Well, we need to begin having conversations about what restorative justice might look like, mm. you know? So there's all these different places in our lives where people who have been through this trauma can begin to take control of, of, of their own narrative, um, of their own healing. Um, and I think for me at least, and for a lot of people I know, uh, working with young people, working with parents groups, and trying to make sure that we begin all with the same knowledge um, so we can have the conversations, that, I don't know if I'll ever feel safe, but it helps me feel stronger. I love that. I love that because one of the other questions that I had was around the idea of control, mm -hmm. of how do you regain agency um, knowing that the bad thing wasn't your fault, right. but does that mean other bad things will happen and it'll still not be your fault and you're just gonna be at the mercy of hoping people don't hurt you? Um, that, is, that is a profound question that has baffled <laughs> people yeah. for millennia. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I think you know, it comes back to something that you and I were beginning to explore, um, as I'm exploring still, um, earlier and that is, uh, in this time when our lives feel so controlled by the outside and technology is such a big piece of all of this, more than ever, we are starving for community. Mm -hmm. And I think those of us who, who live for children and work for kids and, and, and young adults, um, we understand how desperate so many of them are for community and that's something we can control. We can control, we have a lot of, unless you've got a, like, you're caring for an elderly person or, or you're, you know, you have your own health issues or you got a new baby, we have a lot of time, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? A um, lot more than we often want to admit. And so if you can consciously choose to take some of that time and put that into building communities that are important to you, mm -hmm. you know, what can you do in your own quiet, small way? Some people do it in a large, loud way. Other people, it's, um, you know, just the, making sure that every teenager who crosses your path, you look at them in the eye with respect and you smile at them. 
especially the kids that look like they're angry at the world. They're angry at the world because somebody hurt them. Mm -hmm. So let them know that you're not going to be that person. I think about the kid-led community a lot, and a lot of uh, my work is about diversity in publishing and equity and justice, and I work in both kids and adults, but I think uh, folks mention how kid-led is a little bit further ahead, and I think that's because it's in service of children, mm. and that people say, well, we at least have to do right by the kids. What does that look like? now and what is the role of the artist especially when this is many questions jumbled into one one that i didn't write down so so <laughs> okay, bear take, with take me um we see censor censorship we right. see uh folks uh banning books whether because of fear of parental backlash or because they don't know quite how to handle that in the classroom, so better not to touch it. We, or because of their own views, that they don't feel like this is appropriate for children, or they, they have their own um, ideologies mm -hmm. that are contrary to the subject matter. And the, the biggest difficulty I found in working with KidLit is that there is the adult gatekeeper between the book and the kid who needs that book. So respecting all the adults who stand there as gatekeepers, mm. you, in the, your book Shout, you mention that principal who oh, yeah. derailed one of your uh, school visits. With res knowing that those barriers are in place, how do you get to the kids anyway because uh, in you mentioned your conversation with walter dean myers at the national book awards and how you acknowledge that the kids you're writing for don't necessarily have their home libraries right. you know they didn't get to go have nice sunday walks and after the farmer's market pick out one book like that wasn't their lived experience so how do you reach those kids who desperately need to be reached knowing that there are barriers that are not to sound cynical, but actually working against you, yeah. like actively trying to stop you. Um, well, let me just jump to the first part uh, of your question, because I want to thank you for your leadership um, here in Canada. Mm. Uh, and in the United States, we have We Need Diverse Books, and we had great leaders like Walter Dean Myers and now Jackie Woodson. And, and though that kind of leadership um, you are helping to make our world better and you are, you know, like there's a lot of white people in this audience. I see you, my mayonnaise people. And, um, and we have failed and um, we, so many of us, I include myself here, we were perpetuating what we had been brought up in. And so when we look at, at, um, at, at the racial component of, of children's literature, we have had incredible leadership and we've needed it. And that's helping the the adults, other adults in the room go, oh, 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 okay, now I can begin to learn about this. Um, and I think that in, in, in a similar way, people like me who are comfortable talking about family traumas uh, and sexual violence and things like that can provide leadership for people who re reject those conversations. Um, it also helps that my daddy was a preacher. Um, so I speak Jesus. Um, I can talk Bible. And um, so when I'm very comfortable with conservative audiences, regardless of whatever religious um, background they come from. But when I was first censored, I have to admit that my reaction was not terribly loving. Um, at first, I cried, like for the first year. And then my dad told me to get over myself. And then I got angry. And then my mom said that wasn't useful. And then I began to actually talk and act, tried to interview people who were trying to censor my books and talk to principals and librarians who were like, yeah, I would love to buy your book from my school, but I'm afraid to put it on the shelf because I need to keep my job. Mm -hmm. And I realized that we, had, we all had something in common, and that's the key. The key is to figure out what do I have in common with this person that I have a huge disagreement with mm -hmm. because Overwhelmingly, there are obviously some cases where you're not going to have anything in common and you've got to have a different strategy. But what we have in common is that we love our children. Mm. 
and we care deeply about them. And when we have that in common, we can, that, now we can begin to build on it. One of the things that has happened over and over in 20 years when Speak's been challenged in schools is that most schools in the United States have policies. So if a parent brings a challenge, a committee is formed, members from the community sit on the committee, the parent does, some administrators, and everybody has to read the entire book, not just page 134. Mm -hmm. and Overwhelmingly, when that parent comes to the first meeting and has read the entire book, they withdraw their challenge. Mm. Um, the truth is, is that every culture I know of has always used story to pass on wisdom and to pass on morality. This is how we used to do it in the oral tradition, and now most of the cultures around the world have a written, not all of them, but we still use stories in whatever format, TikTok videos, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, to pass on wisdom and morality, which is what we want our kids to have. We want to give our kids their compass heading that will guide them through the world as safely as possible. Um, the difference is some people think we can do that for kids by telling them don't, mm. right? Just tell them don't. That's that old authoritarian, and it's not very effective. If you've ever tried to raise a teenager, you know that that's not very effective. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, we're coming back to the point that most of the adults did not themselves have parents or adults in their lives who could talk about these things. So if this generation of adults can screw our courage to the sticking point and learn within like intimate groups, with friends groups, with book clubs, with faculty groups, how do we have these conversations? How do we talk through these intimidating things? and then come up with the language and the approach to children. Um, and that requires people like me to open my arms and my heart to people who I'm often diametrically opposed to politically. Mm. But we have that common thing that we love our children and we can build from that. That's really hard work, Lori. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> it's really hard, you know what's easier? It's a lot easier to be like, well, such and such county banned my book because there are a bunch of racist, terrible people and sucks for them and buy my book out of spite. It actually even, it feels better even. It feels <laughs> like, a lot better. <laughs> but it doesn't get you very it far. It doesn't get you far. It doesn't, it get, doesn't you get you the result. You very far. And it doesn't, and ultimately, our job is to be the grown-ups, right? And if the yeah. goal is to look at the conflicts, always have the opportunity for uh, resolution and growth. I'm thinking about what you said about how every family is touched by this and how the trauma of parents and previous generations will, by its very nature, be passed on in some way to future generations. And so I'm thinking about how much undoing mm. it takes then to fix it. And you keep talking about how we can fix this in one generation. And I'm like, oh, Lori, tell me how, because I'm getting tired. Um, well, first of all, we have to acknowledge the intersectionality um, that is inherent whenever you're talking about people who have been harmed by sexual violence. Um, in the United States, I think too often there's this, you know, you, you, you watch some stupid ABC after school special or Hallmark movie and it's always the blonde skinny cheerleader, right? Um, and that, that just, the narrative has not broadened to be real, which is that um, women of color face so much more sexual violence um, than white women. Um, in the United States, and I think in Canada too, women from indigenous nations face the highest rate of sexual violence. And their systems are complicated exponentially by all the different judiciary levels and policing levels. Um, on college campuses in the United States, transgendered people face the highest risk of sexual violence. And in the United States, one in six men slash boys are victims of sexual violence. And you think it's hard for women to come forward and talk about those stories. Those boys and men often wait until their 60s and 70s. And they leave, I've, I'm thinking of some people I know personally, who have, out of ignorance and lack of support, left behind them several generations of people who they hurt. 
because they were traumatized, they're raised in a culture that tells men you're, the only uh, emotion you should be showing is anger, and they have all this pain and fear, which they transmute through alcohol usually into pain, and then they inflict it on somebody else. So beginning to understand the scope of the problem and how it affects everybody in different ways is the first piece. Mm -hmm. That's so, so uh, uh, knowledge. In the US we have RAIN, R-A-I-N-N dot org. It's a wonderful resource. You've got uh, in Ontario, you've got a whole system of, of clinics and information online that people can use. Um, and the next piece is to begin to talk about it. One of the most amazing things that happened to me on the Shout Book Tour, I've always had people coming up to me and, and disclosing what they've been through. It's, uh, it's, I feel like that's such a privilege and a gift when somebody shares that. But um, in the, with the Shout Book Tour, and I think this has everything to do with Me Too gaining currency, people were standing up in the audience and disclosing what had happened to them. Mm. Sometimes for the first time in their lives because they felt they were in a space that was safe and they were with kindred spirits because they had all come to learn about this the way I'm telling the story. Mm. Um, so I, I, that's why I'm, I think we could do it in one generation. We have a, a new generation of educators and a younger generation of administrators, not every place, but in enough places that we can begin to turn the tide. Um, and uh, when, especially when things feel really dark, that's when you double down on the number of candles that you light. Mm. I have one last question and then Tanya is going to help us with the Q&A. Um, tell me about the candles that you light. How do you take care of yourself so you can keep doing this day after day? Oh, that's so wonderful because you, you can't, you not help anybody if you um, if you burn yourself out. Uh, self care, especially these days, man. Y'all are having an election too. Um, it's requirement. Um, and so for me, self care looks like getting enough sleep every night. Uh, a lot of I'm in the best shape of my life right now because I am so pissed off that I run a lot uh, and I lift a lot. I'm getting really strong. I lift a lot of weights. Um, also, I think that my favorite form of resistance is joy. Mm. Um, and that means I've, I've actually been much more deliberate the last couple of years about making time with friends and making new friends and like being more uh, present in our community, our kidlit community. And just when, when, when the world hands me something joyous, just celebrating it. Because um, you know, we don't know what happens tomorrow. We have this moment. Um, and if we stay grounded in joy, if we're clear about our values and the direction of our path, we don't know where the path is going to end up, but we can see the next few steps. We can do that. That's wonderful. Thank you so, so oh, thank much. Thank you, Derek.